this is it guys our review of the most hyped up car in Malaysia since well ever the new Proton X50 so can it actually live up to all that hype well the short answer is no if you are one of those people who expect it to be absolutely perfect or at least near perfect well I'm sorry to disappoint it's not the reality is the X50 has quite a few minor issues and flaws that hold it back which we will cover in this video Before we begin, do take note that this is our shortened version of this review. The full version with extra details covering the X50's pros and cons more extensively is available on our YouTube channel, but be warned, it is one hour long. If you're looking to buy the X50, I'd recommend that you take the time to watch the full version, but if you're more of a casual viewer, this video will cover all the necessary details too. The Proton X50 range starts from 79,000 ringgit for the standard model, going up to 103,000 ringgit for this flagship variant. I've already done a detailed video breaking down the differences between the four variants, so do check that out if you want to know what each version offers. From the outside, I do have to mention that the X50 looks really, really small. Well, it's not quite a Myvi SUV as some people have said it. It's a little bit bigger than that, but visually, it does look a lot smaller than the Honda HR-V. In person, you wouldn't have guessed that this car's dimensions is actually almost a match to the HR-V. And in fact, this is actually wider and taller than the Honda. Still, in terms of styling, the X50 makes the X70 look a couple of years older immediately. It's very sporty, it's very modern, it's very fashionable all at the same time. And overall, this is a very striking design that I think will stand the test of time quite well. Moving on to the side, the premium flagship models get these dual-tone 18-inch wheels together with red-painted brake calipers all around. They also get Continental UC6 tyres, which is a pretty good rubber, but be warned, this will cost over 400 ringgit per corner to replace, so be prepared for that. Around the back, a lot of people have commented that the back doesn't quite match the aggressive front end of this car, and here, I have to agree with them. It doesn't look ugly per se, but I think it just looks a bit too plain, a bit too boring compared to the front end. What is more universally liked are the quad tailpipe design down here. Now these are real actual pipes, as in each one of the four pipes are actually connected to the exhaust system. Now this is a refreshing change of pace compared to what we've seen lately with Mercedes-Benz AMGs, the Volkswagens, and even the Proton Perdana. Inside the Proton X50, it's a wild mix of really, really good and at the same time, really, really bad as well. But I'll start with the good stuff, which is design and quality. In here, you do get a feel of classiness that you don't get in any of this car's Japanese rivals, especially the Honda HR-V. This feels like a class or two above. In terms of materials, the entire top half is built of very nice feeling soft materials. As you move down the cabin, the plastics do gradually get harder and harder and rougher, but that is to be expected in this class. This is still a B-segment vehicle after all, but at no point does this car feel absolutely cheap or nasty. Well, except one part, which is actually a major issue for me. The front door handles, they just don't feel like it's gonna last very long. It feels like at some point, it's going to snap. Another major issue here that I think stems from the conversion from left-hand drive to right-hand drive is the lack of adjustability of the right-hand side side mirror. Even at its widest position, the view angle is still too narrow to give a good view out over the blind spots over here. Now, before all you Proton fanboys come at me with pitchforks, I actually do like certain parts of this car's cabin. This instrument cluster over here really hits the mark and I think it really fits the futuristic look and feel of this car overall. This has a fully electric sunshade and sunroof setup and of course there is a one-touch control to it. The sunshade itself actually does a very good job of blocking the sun when you're driving in the middle of the day but it doesn't quite block enough of the heat coming through the sunroof so you are going to have to tint the sunroof for obviously extra cost 
Now let's talk about the big center screen over here with the fancy GKUI 19 interface. Now the interface itself does look very good and the response time is actually quite nice. It's all very snappy, the reaction is quite quick, but actually I don't really have much nice things to say about it. The biggest issue I have with this system is the lack of an Apple CarPlay or Android Auto connection. Instead, there is a QD Link app, which is basically a mirror link function for your iPhones and Android. But compared to a proper integration of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, this is a very, very poor alternative. In Proton's defense, there are full functionalities of all the apps that you would want to use on this system like navigation and audio. But instead of using apps such as Google Maps, Waze or Spotify, this screen over here forces you to use other unknown weird apps such as its AMAP navigation and Jukes music. And I'm not even done yet with this screen. This car does have a full 360 degree camera, but it looks like you're watching a 3GP video. It is that blurry. As for rear quarters, as you can see, there's absolutely nothing to worry about in terms of space. It's really quite spacious back here. As we've shown before, even a person as tall as six feet can sit behind himself in this car with no space issues whatsoever. Now, this might not be quite as spacious as the Honda HRV, but I think in the back here, the seats are slightly more comfortable and I think it's slightly wider as well. You will still struggle to fit three adults in the back bench over here, but that's the same story with pretty much the entire B segment SUV class as well. But at least you have a rather flat floor in the back here. One major upgrade that the X50 has over its base Geely car is the rear aircon vents. Now, this has been fitted exclusively for the Malaysian market because, you know, our special weather. As for the boot, the X50 starts off on the wrong foot because there's no proper grab handle to lift up the tailgate. There's just this small little lip by the boot release button for you to lift this rather heavy tailgate. I mean, come on, how hard would it have been to design a proper recess for this? As for the boot itself, this is definitely on the smaller side of things with just 330 litres of space. That's actually the smallest in the entire class, smaller even than the Mazda CX-3 and Hyundai Kona, both of which are not known for their practicality either. Just for a comparison, the Honda HR-V has a 515 litre boot space that's over 55% bigger than this one. That is a massive difference. But then again, I really don't think it's that bad back here. I think the load lip is quite low and the aperture is rather wide. You can easily fit in a few large suitcases in here, no problem. Overall, I think it's a usable boot. Bigger would have been better, obviously, but it's still not a deal breaker for me. This is our first taste of what the X50 is like in the real world. Let's talk about the engine first. The X50 has two engines, but they both run very similar configurations of a 1.5 liter, three cylinder turbocharged engine. The cheaper three versions, the standard, executive and premium, all get an MPI version of that engine, whereas this flagship version gets a more advanced TGDI direct injection version of the same engine. The power outputs are a little bit different. The MPI engine gets 150 PS and 226 Newton meters of torque, whereas the full fat TGDI version makes 177 PS and 255 Newton meters of torque. That is a fair upgrade both in terms of power and torque. But having spoken to a few people who have driven both cars, I've been told that there isn't much of a significant difference between the two engines at all. But I'll wait and see until I get to drive the MPI engines to give my full comment. So for this review, I'll be focusing more on the TGDI engine in this flagship variant. All X50 variants get the same 7-speed wet dual clutch transmission, the same one that we've seen in the CKD X70 before. Both the engine and transmission are co-developed between Geely and Volvo. Geely, of course, owns 100% of Volvo. The engine and transmission are a little bit controversial 
in Malaysia. But let's talk about the engine first. The controversial bit about the engine is the fact that it is a three-cylinder unit instead of the more mainstream four-cylinder orientation. Now, the stigma around three-cylinder engines is, of course, that it's very unrefined, that it vibrates a lot. And I think anybody who has driven a three-cylinder Perodua, the Viva, the Asia, and perhaps the Kanchil before that, will know what I'm talking about. But that's when we're talking about regular three-cylinder engines. This one over here is built to a much higher standard. Again, co-developed by Volvo. Volvo, remember, has always been the odd player out in the European markets. When everybody was using four-cylinder or six-cylinder engines, Volvo was out alone playing with five-cylinder turbo engines for the longest time. So they've had long history of containing, managing vibrations coming from an odd cylinder engine. So when it comes to developing a three-cylinder engine, Volvo was ahead of the game. Now, Volvo and Geely claim that they have come to a point where this three-cylinder engine feels just as refined as a traditional four-cylinder engine. And for the most part, I would have to agree with them. When you're driving normally, when you're accelerating up and down the gears, or even when you are completely stopped and idling, you do not feel anything coming from the engine. But I would be lying to say that this does not feel like a three-cylinder engine at all because there are key moments where this is obviously a three-cylinder engine versus a four-cylinder engine. Number one is when you are starting the engine, especially at cold startups in the morning. The engine comes to life with a bit of a vibration that you certainly feel through the seats, through the pedals, through the steering wheel and it will quickly even out as the engine heats up. But that's something that you will feel pretty much every morning, really. And then at very low throttle applications, when you're accelerating slowly between 1,000 to 2,000 RPM, there is a slight vibration coming through the pedals. Now, all these things you would only notice if you are looking for any sort of vibrations or faults in the car, of course. I think if you're living with the car day in and day out, you'll quickly forget about it. Another so-called controversial detail is the fact that this car runs a timing belt system instead of a chain drive. Now, this is only an issue here in Malaysia where people have formed camps, the timing belt camp and the chain drive camp. And um, yeah, nowhere else in the world is this an issue at all. So with this car, there is a timing belt system and you do have to change it around every 110,000 kilometers or about five and a half years or something like that. And the cost to change all that is about 400 ringgit. I think 400 bucks every five years for a car costing 100,000 ringgit. That is not a big deal at all. Now let's move on to the gearbox. This is a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission. And specifically to Malaysia again, dual-clutch transmissions have developed a rather bad and um, unreliable reputation, especially with the early DSG Volkswagens as well as the Ford Power Shifts. But you do have to remember that most of those failures had been the dry-clutch version of the dual-clutch transmission. The wet type versions have been far more reliable and durable and thankfully the one that's fitted here is a wet type dual clutch transmission. Just like the engine, it's also co-developed between Volvo and Geely and because of that, it has had to go through extensive durability and reliability testings and standards. Now as to why they've chosen a DCT instead of a CVT or a automatic transmission, it's all in the name of efficiency. Gilly and Volvo says that with this dual clutch transmission, they have achieved one of the highest standards of efficiency in the industry. This gearbox is claimed to have a power efficiency of up to 97%. This is much higher than what can be achieved with a traditional automatic gearbox. Gilly says that a traditional AT can go up to about 90%. In terms of efficiency, three-cylinder engines are supposed to be a fair bit more efficient compared to four-cylinder engines. And of course, they also have a lot less 
moving parts there's less things to go wrong and of course they are slightly cheaper to manufacture in the first place so the next time anybody asks why Proton and Geely is using a three-cylinder engine and a DCT now you know it's also worth noting that this car is built on Geely's own BMA platform this is not a Volvo platform like in the XC40 the XC40 runs a much more advanced Volvo CMA platform this is a cheaper simpler version that is developed by Geely not Volvo so yeah it's not quite a budget Volvo guys but enough of all the boring technical talk how does it actually feel out on the road I'll tell you what this engine is fantastic with this car you get a boot full of torque very low down the revs so you don't have to rev the engine high up at all you just get a very powerful and constant surge forward and the transmission also works very well together with the engine it all feels very very well sought out now Proton claims that this car does 0 to 100 in about 7.9 seconds now I've timed this car myself and I failed to do 7.9 seconds I've done around 8.5 to 8.7 seconds depending on the road and the weather conditions or whatnot but I think that's close enough to the actual official claims it's certainly not quite as slow as what we've seen when we tested it in Sepang the previous time it's not a 10 second car it's more of an 8.5 second car in that sense the difference between this and its closest rival the Honda HRV is absolutely massive I've always mentioned that once you've experienced a turbo car it's really hard to go back to a naturally aspirated car and I think if you've driven this car back to back with the HRV you would completely agree with me now but there's also a different saying that once you go turbo your wallet's gonna blow and that of course is in terms of fuel efficiency but it really isn't as bad as that I've had this car for about a week now and I've done about 500 kilometers and over that I've averaged about 8.5 to 9 liters per 100 kilometers and over a full tank of 45 liters I managed to get just about 500 kilometers that's not too bad really now let's talk about how the DCT feels the dual clutch transmission just like on the CKD X70 it doesn't feel like a dual clutch transmission at all it feels much more like a traditional automatic torque converter transmission really to be honest but in terms of the gearbox response it's actually pretty good as soon as you jab the throttle the engine climbs up as it drops down a couple of gears and everything is done very very smooth very quickly now let's talk about ride and handling now this isn't really a proton at all much like the x70 was not really a proton to begin with this is a Geely product and um, Proton has just been given a little bit of a leeway to sort of retune the suspension to suit Malaysian roads more but with the X50 they've actually done a fair bit more than they did with the X70 this feels a lot more like a traditional true blue Proton car to drive the suspension especially is very well sorted it feels almost as sophisticated as a European car it feels a lot more controlled than say a typical Japanese car in the way it absorbs bumps even when you're going slow or fast or anything in between and through corners it's absolutely beautiful Proton has really worked its magic and its technical know-how in terms of making this car ride and handle beautifully through Malaysian roads so as a driving tool this is a very very competent machine and if the mood comes in it can deliver some fun as well in that sense it's a far better balance than the X70 if there's one thing that really spoils the driving experience of this car it's the refinement or rather the lack of the biggest issue is in wind noise where as soon as you hit 80 km per hour 100 km per hour or god forbid 120 km per hour there is a really significant wind rustling coming around from the A pillars and the wing mirrors I haven't really experienced something this bad in a modern car for as long as I can remember I think there's something 
that seriously wrong with this. I've been told that Proton is aware of the problem and they are looking for ways to fix this issue. So yeah, we'll see what they can do with this problem. I just hope that if they do find a solution, they wouldn't forget the existing car owners out on the road already. I hope they can roll out proper updates for cars that are already on the road. Yeah, fingers crossed for that. Yeah, this really, really annoys me. I can't understand how Proton claims to have done so many thousands and hours of test driving here in Malaysia and none of them picked up on this issue. I can't blame that at all. So from the absolute lowest point of the car to the absolute best, the level 2 semi-autonomous driving features on the X50. This car has far more advanced feature set even compared to its bigger, more expensive brother, the X70. The X70, Proton says, has a level 1 autonomous driving feature which is just adaptive cruise control. This one takes it up a level further. This has intelligent cruise control which is basically a semi-autonomous driving feature. Now let's talk about how it all works. The intelligent cruise control system uses two things, a camera up on the windscreen up here as well as a millimeter wave radar on the bottom of the front bumper. So the radar and the camera works together to sort of like sense and scan the road ahead, scanning for cars, scanning for bikes, scanning for pedestrians and of course scanning for road lines. So with all that data, the car will then drive itself almost to keep it in lane, keep it away from other cars, keep a safe distance from other cars and brake if necessary. This also has something called traffic jam assist which means it can drive itself, technically I mean through traffic jams. So all you have to do is press a button, set everything up and then it will maintain a set distance to the car in front in stop and go traffic situations. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the bad parts of this car's ADA systems because obviously as you've seen throughout this whole video with all the good things, there are the bad things as well. This car isn't really quite as perfect as it really should be. So this here, we are in a traffic jam situation where this car's traffic jam assist is helping me drive the car. So it is maintaining the distance to the car in front but in doing so, every single time the car is braking, there is a bit of a clicking sound coming from the brake pedal. Listen up. That. Do you hear that? That comes in every single time. And when you're in a traffic jam, that happens over and over and over. Okay, listen. Yeah. How annoying is that? Come on. Besides that, there is also this small other issue that I sort of found by accident. Well, basically, when you come to a stop and you have your auto hold function on, like now, coming to a complete stop. Yeah. But here's what happens when you're at a complete stop and your auto hold is on. You can press the brakes and when you lift the brakes, there's this weird sound. What is that? Come on, man. That does not give you confidence at all. Proton, if you watch this, please, please get a fix for this. So that's our review of the Proton X50. Like I said at the start, this car has a long list of faults and flaws. So those who are looking to buy one, do so with your eyes wide open. Know what you're getting into. But ultimately, is this car good enough for me to recommend it to everyone? The answer has to be a definite yes. Despite this car's minor niggles all around, it's still an extremely good car all around. It's quick, it's comfortable, it's very good to drive and it's even actually quite spacious inside. But more than anything else, there's just nothing else that comes even close to the level of value that this car offers in the market today. In many ways, the X50 is every bit as good as it promised to be. And for me, none of its minor niggles are anywhere near big enough to be deal breakers. I'll do more videos on my X50 when I do get it. But for now, what do you think of the X50? 
and my review of it. If there's anything that you disagree with, do let me know in the comments section below. For now, thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.